Welcome to Defining Moments. I'm Suzanne Quast. And here I sit down with influential people and we discuss the defining moments that shape their lives in a meaningful way. But it's not the moment that defines them, it's what they do with the moment. And my guest today used one of his darkest moments as a catalyst for growth and massive success. His name is Evan DeMarco. He is a biochemist and sports nutrition entrepreneur. He has generated over $500 million worth of sales and become one of the biggest names in the supplement world. Today, he's going to talk to us about overcoming adversi adversity, give us some tools and tips about supplements, and give us business advice for entrepreneurs. Evan is an inspiration and a reminder to all of us with what we can do with our defining moments. Here are his moments. Drift away. Beating like the sound of love. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so I have to give a discla disclaimer. I'm kind of geeking out a little bit. <laughs> um, I started using Omax Health Supplements a couple months ago, and I noticed a significant increase in the way that I felt and also in my sleep. You know, my sleep. I was having a difficult time sleeping, and I had tried everything, and I finally found something that worked. So I was like, I have to find out who created this. I have to know. So when I reached out to you and we were talking on the phone, you said that a lot of your massive success actually originated from a very difficult, dark time for you in your life. Yeah. And I'd be curious um, for you to share that with us. Yeah. So, so as, we, as we discussed about it, uh, for me, it was my divorce. Um, and I think divorce has become more and more commonplace, uh, especially in the United States, right? It's the, the divorce rate is 60% or, or if not higher, depending on the geography. Um, and, and divorce really becomes the death of, of a dream that someone once had. A hundred percent. And and for me, that's what it was, is uh, I, I met a woman, I fell in love. We moved from Colorado to Sacramento of all places, uh, <laughs> got married, had a kid, and we're on this path, this trajectory of what I thought my life was supposed to be. And it was really inspired a lot by my grandparents who kind of, uh, you know, 54 years uh, before he passed away. So, uh, you know, they had that love that lasted a lifetime. Mm. And mine didn't. And, and there was this moment that I, I do talk about a lot where my ex-wife and my daughter are literally, you know, it, it's the end of our relationship and she's leaving the house. And, and it was this moment where the gravity or the, the oxygen went out of the room and just gravity brought me to the ground. I, I just mm. couldn't get off the floor. Um, and, and that was, it was that moment where actually I had to decide, is this gonna define me for the rest of my life or can I pick myself up and move forward? And the interesting thing is, is having a daughter, I didn't have a choice. You're right. Um, I could have just laid there and, and, and wallowed in misery and, and let that moment define me, but as we talked about, I think prior to this, one of my most defining moments was the recognition that I wasn't going to let that moment define me. Amen to that. Yeah. And you know, first of all, thank you as a man, it's really nice to hear you talk about that and to be vulnerable and open. So often we hear women talk about this moment, but we don't really hear it from a man's perspective openly. And so A, thank you for sharing. And two, you know, I heard Amy Poehler describe divorce and it really was accurate. And she said, divorce is like having the pieces of your life on a picnic blanket. Somebody comes over to the picnic blanket and shakes it and everything is falling and you're trying to get something and you catch nothing and you watch it all fall in front of you. Yeah. How were you able to then pick up the pieces of your life? Uh, well, one step at a time is the easy answer. But, you know, it, it was kind of funny. One of the catalysts for my divorce was one of my businesses going under mm. um, and then that business being sued. Um, and, and so it was not only was I in the middle of a divorce, but then I had all of this financial turmoil. You know, I was in a class action lawsuit. I was, you know, I was named as one of the personal defendants in this lawsuit. Oh, wow. Um, basically a business fold. So I, I move out of my house, my marital home, um, into this really horrible two-bedroom <laughs> furnished apartment, which was just like an Ikea catalog that just exploded. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I remember this was another one of those great defining moments. Um, I couldn't sleep in the bed there. It was Why? weird. I had this I had this internal monologue going where me sleeping in the bed was the recognition or admitting to myself that my marriage was over. Mm. And so I'm not <laughs> sleeping at all anyway, but even if I would sleep, I'd pass out on the on this horribly uncomfortable IKEA couch for a couple hours. Um, and, and as I'm sitting there in this horrible apartment and I'm spending every day with my daughter, but then you know trying to figure out how to piece back uh, the pieces of my life, it's like, 
what am I good at? And, and mm. I forgot what it was that had made me successful prior to my marriage. And so it just became this list of like, what can I do? What, am I, what do I know that I can bring to the equation? Um, and so then I just started calling people. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm back in the game. This is what I'm doing. What can I do? And it was one step after another step. It was, you know, develop this product for this company and make a couple bucks, you know, to, to pay the bills until... Yep. And, and eventually, um, you know, a really big company called me and said, hey, we want you to, you know, do all of our product development for prenatal vitamins. Wow. Which, interestingly enough, was something that I only got into when I found out I was going to be a father. So, so you had already, this is like, you had already done a lot of the research on this yeah. anyway. So this was prepared you for this moment. Yeah. So my daughter was really the catalyst for the, for the next evolution of my life. And so an, a big international pharmaceutical company called me and said, we want you to run all of our prenatal product development. Um, and so I did, and I, and I actually was able to patent a couple products and ingredient technologies, which now really represent about 25% of the global prenatal vitamins. That's a big deal. I, I'm excited about that. That's Well, and I've heard you talk before, so I did a little bit of research on prenatal vitamins. And some of the ingredients that you say are really important in these vitamins are not even in most of them. Yeah. That's... Right? Because you said, what, which, it's DHA that's important. DHA. And then there's choline. Choline, but a choline. very specific type of choline, and this is what I found in all the research. Um, you know, being the geek that I am, when it came <laughs> to developing a prenatal vitamin for my daughter and for my wife at the time, I wanted the best. And so you start doing the research, and you're like, this prenatal hasn't evolved in the last 30 years. The one wow. that my wife was taking in the beginning was the same one that my mom was probably <laughs> taking. You're like, well, we've come a long way in yeah. the understanding of how our bodies work. Why haven't prenatals changed? So what I really found out and the research was during the first year of our lives when our brains grow the most, there's two constituent parts of breast milk that really are the catalyst for that. One is DHA and the other is choline, but a very specific type called alpha glycerol phosphocholine. Okay. Which is a phospholipid. A lot okay. of big words here. There's there gonna be a are. test. Well, like, there's gonna be a test later what? on. <laughs> uh, okay. So these two constituent parts really accelerate brain growth in the first year. Okay. And then we don't get them for the rest of our life after that. I mean, choline, that type of choline comes in like beef liver. You know, who eats oh, that wow. on a daily no. basis? Um, but if we supplement with it, then we can really start to look at improving brain health later on in life. So not only did this become the catalyst for this global uh, prenatal vitamin technology, but now it's really represented in a lot of our neurocognitive products for adults. Wow, because um, I was gonna say then if this is so good for us and why you know, can normal women or can we take prenatals even if we're not pregnant? Uh, absolutely, and, and so like the Omax Cognitive Boost product, which I Which I, I love. Had, yeah, that's, uh, that's actually just that. It's the DHA and the GPC and a fusion that's designed in quantities for people looking for brain health. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so now we're talking about supplements, and I was telling him earlier we would be doing everyone a disservice if we didn't ask some questions because I'm sitting down with an expert. <laughs> so if the normal consumer, what should I look for? Because there are so many different kinds of supplements. Yes. What should I be taking, and what are the ingredients to look out for? So th that is one of the best questions ever, and one I probably get three to four times a day. Um, my de facto response is, first of all, where are you getting your supplement advice from? And I always oh. think of the source, right? Is it your mailman, your neighbor, <laughs> you know, the, the minimum wage person at the vitamin shop who knows nothing about your physiological makeup? Stop listening, to, or Google, that's a perfect, you know. Yeah. Like stop listening to all of these other outside influences and start listening to yourself. And the best way to do that is with diagnostic testing. Okay. You know, blood work, CBC, CHEM7, lipid profiles, you know, kidney function. Start really looking at your body as, you know, I mean, a perfect example of if, if you're a Ferrari and you go into the shop and you're like, something's not right, the mechanic's like, well, I think that's wrong with it. Why don't we spend a lot of money and a lot of time fixing that? No, they're going to hook it up to a computer and say, that's what's wrong with it. That's how we fix it. Your body's just a Ferrari. Um, Amen to Amen. That. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a very nice Ferrari. So... Same thing is hook it up to the diagnostic tool and figure out what's wrong with it. Where are you deficient? And that blood work, that diagnostic testing can be a really great roadmap to understanding what you should be putting in your body. I love that, but then where does somebody go to take these tests? So there's, you know, you can go to your doctor and just get your annual physical. Um, and, and a lot of times your insurance will cover multiple of those. So, or if they don't, pay the couple extra dollars. Go in and optimize every six months. If you go in for your annual physical, you get your blood work done, well, what happened the day, the week, the month prior to that? So it's not a great indication of where you're at. If you're doing it more consistently, 
you're going to start to see the roadmap, you know, the patterns in what your body's doing. You can catch something long before it becomes an issue, and maybe that's a, a disease, maybe that's some problem that you need to address. So that blood work can be really influential in understanding what your body's going through, especially the, you know, if you do it more frequently. Um, another great one is the microbiome test. Which we've talked about, and I think this is fascinating, and I'm going to do it after this. Yes. So there's a great company out there called Viome, V-I-O-M-E. Okay. They have an incredible technology. Go online, order a kit. They send you a kit. Um, you, you send in your poop. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yes. It's fun. <laughs> uh, but what they're going to do is send you back this comprehensive report of what's going on inside your gut. Um, your microbiome, your stomach, that's, that's everything. I mean, your whole life exists from what's going on here. Your immune system, how we respond to things. Uh, and that comes with diet recommendations, food insensitivities, you know, certain things like how's your oral health. Mm. That, it'll pick things up. Are you eating too much microwave food? Um, I mean, it gives you recommendations. Which, how crazy is that, that a test can pick up if you're microwaving too much food? Yeah. Which, just for the record, I got rid of my microwave about a year ago, so I'm feeling really good about that. It was partially laziness that I did it, because it broke, and then I was like, I'm going to get another one, and now I'm never going to get another one. No. Because it's so bad. It's, is, is it that bad for you? You know, so one of the, I, I think one of the stories behind the microwave outside of NASA, you know, kind of really inventing that for space travel, was we found out you could... We basically found out what microwaves would do when it came to people standing on top of naval ships because the microwave towers were causing brain cancer. Oh. So, okay. like, oh, well, why don't we just package this into a box and then we can accelerate the molecular speed of food and then heat it up? It's like, so brain cancer led to the invention of the microwave <laughs> in a very roundabout way. But, uh, you know, so, so if we think of it in that context, is it really something that we should be doing to our food? Like, probably not. Probably not. You know, Buy a toaster oven for the love of God. You yeah. know, it's it, you know, so, um, but it, this has become much more pervasive, especially in our society where all of these prepackaged meals are being delivered. There's all of these food mm. delivery system or food services. So people are taking the package from the front porch and putting it right in the microwave. You're right. Um, and we're going to see a lot more. Uh, a lot more issues as a result of the microwave food in the future. Interesting. Okay, so you said uh, for people who are interested in supplements, go get your blood work, go get your, your biogen, microbiome test. Yeah. Microbiome test. Sorry, excuse me. Um, but what do you think of then, like a multivitamin? What do you think of? You know, I know fish oil is a big deal for. Yes. You know, do you think that every person should be taking those kinds of things? Or I think no? a multivitamin is great. Um, and you're not going to pee out. You're not going to pee out a, um, a multivitamin. Well, you are to a certain extent, right? I mean, you know, they're water soluble. There's going to be some fat soluble so a great thing about a multivitamin is your body's pretty much going to assimilate what it needs and get rid of the rest okay uh, so there's you know the multivitamin is the great do no harm kind of vitamin um, fish oil a good quality fish oil absolutely uh, and, and that's one of those the WHO rec or suggests that about 80% of the US population is deficient in these fatty acids so interesting a that's a big large percentage huge yeah well, you know, we used to be, our bodies are designed to be close to water. We're, we're, you know, designed to eat fish. We're not designed to live in Kansas and eat beef and <laughs> corn, you know. That's not what our bodies are designed to do. So when we moved away from this Mediterranean diet, we started to see something that's called the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Okay. Um, 200 years ago, it was about 4 to 1. Okay. And that's pretty healthy. Uh, f you know, 4 omega-6, you know, parts to 1 omega-3 part. Right now in America, it's about 25 to 1. Wow. And that's really bad because at that level, omega-6 becomes hyper pro-inflammatory. Got it. That's what I was going to ask. Why, what does that ratio mean? It just so means that we're all inflamed, right? And inflammation, if not covered, leads to disease. It's the root cause of all disease. So if your body cannot resolve inflammation because of your diet, you're that much further down the path towards diabetes, cancer, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline, all the things that we really know are systemic from chronic inf inflammation. Interesting. So a fish oil or omega-3s is actually a really great thing Absolutely. to help prevent disease. Yeah. Although oh. we can't legally say that, but... <laughs> Why? Because there's not necessarily, they're not scientific... There's over 22,000 clinical studies on the, uh, the benefits of fish oil for preventing all kinds of disease, but it becomes one of these gray areas where because you're talking about disease claims, the FDA doesn't really like that. Okay, well, I feel like the FDA doesn't do a very good job of regulating supplements and vitamins anyway, so. <laughs> I said it, you did it. So, okay, you've um, 
created so many amazing products and now you've had this massive amount of success and one of the things we talked about on the phone was that you said you had a lot of practical advice for business entrepreneurs that you felt like you know this isn't always as readily available from people who have actually achieved the success yeah so talk to me a little bit about that like what advice do you have for entrepreneurs get into your spreadsheets you, what learn, you, okay. learn the business. You know, it, it's funny, and, and I go to a lot of business conferences, entrepreneur conferences, and they're always talking about high-level stuff. You know, create this course, put this funnel, you know, get this funnel system in place, you know, do this, do that. But so many of these people that are doing these courses and creating these speaking engagements and all that, they've forgotten that business is still business, and if you can't operate profitably, it's not a business, it's a hobby. Yep. And so what it boils down to is fundamentally understanding the basics how much does it cost to acquire a customer versus what are they willing to spend with you yeah and and i think the issue with a lot of the entrepreneurs in the space right now is they're trying to sell information Yo, absolutely there's a course and a mastermind for, for everything. everything yeah and, and guess what that's great today but that's it's a house of cards right because that information which is so readily available the thing that you're selling for twenty five thousand, i'm going to get for free tomorrow through Google. Mm -hmm. So these platforms that are really not predicated for sustainability become an issue. And, and what I tell entrepreneurs all the time is, you know, make sure you're creating true intrinsic value. You know, for me it's supplements or, you know, uh, pharmaceutical products, but I don't care. What's your widget? What are you really selling that's not information based? And what does it cost you to get that customer? And what is that customer willing to spend based off of the value you're willing to give? And mm -hmm. if you can't quantify those two small metrics, then it's a hobby. It's not a business. Well, what about those business coaches? And there's, I mean, how are they going to quantify what exactly they're selling if the product in and of itself is, is themselves? That, then that I, I often turn that question around. It's like, is that really a business? What it, if they're generating, I mean, I, again, I'm, this is me just kind of playing devil's <laughs> advocate. Um, so you think that that's not necessarily sustainable? I don't think it is. Um, and, and the other thing that I really like to talk to people about when it comes to a business is scalability. If you're a business coach, how do you scale that? Mm -hmm. if, you know, if, if you lose all of your teeth tomorrow and you can't speak, mm -hmm. you know, what happens to your business? And, and so ultimately, business should be quantifiable, quantifiable and then scalable. And that's what we've really learned over the last you know, five years in, in developing all of these products and developing all of these successful businesses is that if you don't have something that is quantifiable that you can optimize and then scalable, it's just not built for long-term success. Interesting. Well, then what are your keys to success? Uh, you know, it, it's work hard. People always talk about work smart, not hard, but no, you have to work hard. Yeah. Um, I always talk about changing your trajectory. There's three things that I really say. It's like if you want to change the trajectory of your life, it depends on you know, how hard you're willing to work, mm -hmm. people that you keep close, and what you're willing to sacrifice. Mm. And, and that, that's very hard for the bubblegum Instagram generation uh, to, to swallow. It's like sometimes you have to sacrifice something. You have to live in the horrible apartment. You have to have that defining moment, that yeah. thing that says, okay, I don't want this for the rest of my life. Yep. What am I gonna do to get to the next level? To make it different. Yeah. And I feel like you know, the younger generation, there's a little bit of entitlement and there's not, a little, there's not as much grit and yeah. there's not as much, like you said, sacrifice. You can't have it all. You can one day have it all, but you have to like really focus and hone in on one thing, get really good at that, then move on to the next thing. But it takes a lot of hard work. Yeah. I, you know, I, I interviewed someone, it was like a, right out of college, and I'm like, what is your salary expectation? Like 120, and I'm like, <laughs> like, excuse me? Like, like, you have no experience, but, but that is the generation, you know, that's coming out of college with not only the expectation, but unfortunately the student loan debt. So th there's part of it, it's like, well, if I'm ever going to be able to eat more than Top Ramen and hot dogs, I have to make a little bit more money. Yeah, but I think then that's where then, like you said, the grit comes in, yeah. right? Like for me, like when I first got out of school, I had a lot of debt. I had like, over $60,000 worth of college loans. And, you know, then I bartended on the side. You know, I would work and then I would bartend because I had to pay off my loans. Like, yeah. I was working, I mean, more hours than I was probably um, awake. Yeah. So I think that that's how it probably should be. And, and when you work like that, when you develop that work ethic, then you find that that carries through in so many other things. And, and um, you know, for me, back to my moment, it was, that's what I did. It's like, I had my daughter 50% uh, of the time and, 
you know, she'd be over at my house. The second she would go to sleep, I was working until I literally couldn't keep my eyes open and, anymore. And then wake up and, and be with her and try to be a present father. But it's like, you just, like, there's this many hours in the week. I'm like, I will exist on as little sleep as possible. I will consume as much caffeine as possible yep. to get myself through. And you just find a way. Got it. So just find a way. All right. We're going to get to the uh, final questions. Oh, right. Lightning round. A lightning round. So what's the most difficult decision you've had to make to fulfill your greater purpose? Oh, that's a good one. For me, it's, it's not just one, but it's constant decisions where I have to choose between spending time with my daughter and doing what I need to do to be successful. Mm. Um, and, and those are always the most painful. It's like, I want to be there for her, you know, on the time that I'm supposed to be with her, but maybe there's a conference, maybe there's a meeting. And, and so um, those come up all too frequently, and, and those are always the most difficult ones. Fair enough. And then you just sort of outweigh then how important is this obligation? Yeah. And, and there are plenty of times that I, I haven't keynoted at a conference or, or spoken somewhere because, you know, I'd rather be playing Barbies with my daughter. <laughs> That's really sweet. Okay, what is the best piece of advice you were ever given? Just say no. No, Just that's, uh, <laughs> no, that, like, uh, are you using uh, the dare slogan? Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> best piece of advice I've ever been given. Hmm. You know, I've, I've had so many incredible mentors in my life and, and I've been fortunate enough to surround myself with people who were always smarter than me. And, and I think that's one of the keys to success is try to yep. be the dumbest person in the room whenever you can. Amen to that. Um, but I, I think it comes back to that as, as someone once said is you've got two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much as you speak. Okay. Yeah. I like that. That's. Okay. Uh, what was your greatest failure and what did it teach you? Uh, I think my marriage was my greatest <laughs> failure. Um, <laughs> that, uh, I hear you. Uh, my, <laughs> you know, it's funny with my divorce, that was one of the like really large, overwhelming feelings I had. Not only was I devastated that it was over, but I was, I felt like the biggest failure. Yeah. I was like, Oh my God, like I can't even how I, I didn't even make that work. Yeah. And, and that's that, I think that's a societal thing, right? Because we place so much emphasis on the success of a marriage. And then when it doesn't happen, you know, there is that, that failure, that, that piece that just haunts you. And, and I think it still does. It was, uh, you know, I don't know if that ever goes away, but um, yeah, it, it, that definitely was my biggest failure, but it taught me, it taught me so much about the person that I need to be as an individual. Mm. And, and I think for me in my marriage, uh, I, you know, I hate to say it, but I lost myself as an individual. Yep. And the divorce taught me how to find myself, be happy with myself, and then recognize that, any future relationships are going to be predicated on this is who I am, not some abstract you know, concept of, of what I should be. You know, I always, and I really believe this, think that life happens for you and not to you. And even in those darkest, most horrible moments, you know, I obviously you have to grieve it and you have to get through it. But then if we really take a step back, and for me, if I took a step back and said, what is my opportunity for growth here? Where is my accountability? What did I learn from this? And how can I really be better from this? Yeah. And it was really difficult to look at myself in the mirror, but I did. And I learned that like I can't save people I learned that like I have to make myself a priority my voice matters I have to speak up if not then it's gonna you know things are we're gonna have fights over and over and over again I just think that it taught me so much and I, you know it actually made me an, a much better person and a much better partner now and I'm engaged now and congratulations thank you thank you okay um, final question uh, if you could define the legacy you want to leave behind in a couple of words, what would it be? Great father. Oh, above all else. Above all else. It's, it's more than a couple words, but everything else is just a catalyst to me making the choice to be the father that I want to be. And, uh, you know, I, I think when you have a child and when you make that covenant with someone, it's like, this is, this is what I'm here to do. And, and I... It's funny, as a guy, it's kind, of, it's kind of abstract. You see the belly growing, you're like, I'm gonna be a dad, you're registering for all of the baby stuff, you're learning about <laughs> bottles and nipples and all that stuff, but it, it wasn't until she came out and you know, she just squeezed my finger. You know, she's like four minutes old and squeezed my finger. I'm like, all right, I'm hooked, this is, this is what I wanna be. So um, I wanna be an inspiration to her. I wanna make sure that uh, you know, 
when I pass on to the next whatever that you know she knows that uh, I gave it my all as a dad. Oh, that's really sweet. Okay, well, speaking of, um, we're ending the show now. But speaking of having babies, please tell us. A little <laughs> that's bit a perfect about... segue. <laughs> please tell us about the O shot. O shot, yes. CBD arousal oil and talking to there for our people. That one. That's so. This okay. So it's a baby maker. Um, we talk a lot about CBD, right? Everyone's talking about it in the marketplace. And so in doing all of the research on CBD, what I ultimately found is, is that it had a really cool place in the conversation about sexual health, mainly because CBD um, improves blood flow, relaxes certain muscles, and, and as we found in a focus group testing with this, exponentially improves the orgasmic response. So I created a CBD-based uh, arousal oil for women. Mm. Um, it's just launched a couple months ago, but we were in focus group testing for a while, and it's been, uh, it's been gangbusters. That's amazing. This guy's like a walking invention. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys found as much inspiration and value in this as I have. Where can they find you, Evan? Uh, you know, Instagram, uh, unfortunately, at Evan underscore DeMarco. Uh, life to the max blog com is where you can find a lot of my research. Um, there's some great articles. Uh, and then actually coming up uh, very soon, I've got a really cool passion project about uh, single parents that uh, we'll have to connect with your audience on. It's uh, yes. something I'm so excited about. I was in the Great Salt Flats yesterday in Utah filming for that, so I'm incredibly stoked. So much to come. Thank you, guys.